Welcome uh, to day uh, three here of the, the Dataverse uh, 2020 community meeting. Um, unfortunately, not quite as crowded an auditorium as it was last year in the, the background. Um, so we're all missing the chance to to mingle and interact, but hopefully we've got uh, had some great sessions so far and hopefully a few more uh, for you today before we wrap up. Um, this is the second flexible metadata session. Um, we had a, a a uh, nice one last night, um, and we, we've kind of split the topics uh, into sort of nearer and longer term, but also having two of these just because we're a global organization. And um, last night was very, very late for some of our speakers, and, and uh, you know, it's a little bit uncomfortable this morning, but for the audience, we're trying to make sure everybody gets to be in one of the sessions live. Um, I'm going to... Um, go on here in a second, but uh, uh, I guess on, on behalf of uh, myself and Katie Mika, who's here, um, and Steve um, uh, McEckern, who, who's our uh, co-chairs. Um, uh, Steve was here last night. I don't know if he's going to make it this morning, but uh, we're all glad you can be here and, and uh, uh, hope we give you an interesting session this morning. Um, I'll just put this up. You've probably seen it too many times already. Um, and, and I'll just use it to point out that uh, uh, we decided on this one, rather than, since we've only got an hour, to, rather than break out uh, into groups, we're going to try and keep a coherent thread in the, the sort of verbal discussion. But we really encourage you to use the community notes document. If you have a topic and it's not coming up, you know, go add a new topic in there and, and have a side discussion in, in the text around things. So, um, you know, sort of, sort of have a have a written breakout and a and a, a plenary uh, verbal session here. Um, we have, like I said, we have one hour. Um, you can ask questions in the chat and the document. Um, I think Sonia is doing a great job of kind of watching for comments to come up and questions so that we get them in. You can raise your hand if you want to um, be able to say your comment instead. We'll try watching for those. Um, and again, please add your notes. And, and again, I think ha part of this is really trying to brainstorm and get people's thoughts on priorities and issues and so on. Um, so we'd really like, even if it doesn't come up, that those notes will get written, uh, or, sorry, the notes will get read. Um, we'll really try and integrate them into the thinking that's going on about where to go next in metadata. So, um, you know, please get your thoughts in somehow. Um, all right, so with that, um, Yesterday, um, like I said, was sort of the, the things that are um, sort of more th that exist already or, or are sort of active right now. Um, we had uh, a talk on uh, a new Darwin Core metadata block by Olga Couric, um, both showing that, that you, know, you can do this and then discussing some of the limitations as well. Um, but um, she's done a nice job of, of adding in things for, um, you know, be, being able to describe uh, biological things with Darwin Core um, using the existing mechanisms. Uh, Steve talked about uh, updates to DDI. Um, so you assume most of the insiders know that, that uh, the citation metadata block is, is highly based on DDI. So um, the fact that the DDI group is updating is is uh, important to know, and um, Steve was really advertising the the ability for, you know, the, the interest that this community um, can basically jump into that process and help guide DDI uh, for the next version. Since we're we're a part of that community as well, so Steve would love to have your involvement there. Um, and then we had uh, folks from Dataverse North uh, give us. Sorry, I didn't hear that. If I was supposed to. Um, we then had a discussion of, of uh, best practices by Dataverse North, a nice document that um, really tells you, you know, when you're faced with all of those uh, blank entries on the screen for metadata, what should go in there um, and what are best practices for filling those out with a lot of nice examples and things. So uh, a great add to uh, the documentation of these things. Um, in this session, we're, we're starting to go a little bit more into the future. We've got a couple of uh, takes yesterday um, people were talking about wanting to have connections to external vocabularies, um, being able to connect to external schemas and so on. So we've got a couple of talks um, that address that directly. And then um, we have a talk in the middle that, that's really looking more uh, across a lot of the issues that have come up and, and doing a, a nice job of organizing things that will lead us into the next discussion. 
Um, after the talks, I'm gonna, we'll have some questions on sort of the, the individual talks and things, and then to kick us off into the general discussion, I've got one more slide I'll pull back to on the end. Um, but with that, um, I'd like to go ahead and, and introduce uh, Jonas from the Berlin Science Center for Social Research and let him go ahead and grab the screen share and get going. Okay. Yeah, Jim, thank you. I'm just gonna quickly share my screen, just a second. Um, can you see the presentation now? Yep, it's great. Okay, can you hear me well? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so yeah, welcome to, to the part uh, one, where we talk about leveraging external metadata services. And this is something that I um, tried to find a solution for two years ago at the 2018 DCM. And I stayed for another week after the DCM um, with the project at IQSS. And one of the outputs was to, to generate this issue. Uh, 4772, um, this has since been closed because there's a generalized effort and another ticket that I will link to in a later slide. Um, yeah, the point is to use any API to fill metadata fields and to find a system, a solution to um, make that work, to configure uh, sources for metadata, to fill in the fields by mechanisms like autocomplete, drop boxes, etc. And finally, of course, to keep this information where, where the metadata came from uh, as some kind of provenance data. Um, yeah, I try to I try to summarize the issue uh, for 772 in, this, in these slides, but I think it's a bit too complicated to make it work in this little time. So if you're interested in more depth, just go into the issue. I also have some examples in there how this could be used. And just note this issue is closed and um, the other issue is the one where we'll, we talk about the future. So this idea is about filling in metadata and instead of having to type in name, identifier and everything um, by yourself, there could be a mechanism that after typing the first le couple letters of the name, you would get an autocomplete, uh, autocompletion list with uh, suggestions um, that match, match your search term. And the simplest um, outcome would be that you just fill in one field with, let's say, a name, but there could also be the opportunity to fill in um, fields that are connected to this, let's say, for an ORCID, not only to fill in the name, but also the identifier and the affiliation. Uh, yeah, I already mentioned that there could be different UI representations depending on the data type. And yeah, they, the idea came from 2018 and has not left my mind. <laughs> um, this is just the example what, uh, what one usage of this uh, mechanism could look like, um, where you could transfer information that's available at ORCID um, for this fictional person, jo Josiah Carberry, um, to just fill in the person details in the Dataverse metadata uh, that's seen on the right. And things like the full name and the identifier and the affiliation could be pulled from ORCID into these fields. Um, of course, the identifier scheme field would also need to be filled in this case and this would, be, would need to be something that's in the configuration and could be something that we set the author identifier scheme with a fixed value 50, which uh, represents ORCID. Um, so I think for every usage, there will be some specialty like this fixed identifier scheme um, controlled field that needs to be handled. And this is just one example for problems that could come up by using this. Um, just uh, to elaborate on this. have five minutes. All right, thank you. Um, on the bottom right is the result um, that's basically the, the JSON representation of an ORCID entry. And that is 
where we could pull the information from. And as you see in ORCID, it would be uh, separated into given names and family name. And we would need to combine those. So there's another step of, of string man man manipulation that would be need to be done before it could go into the metadata. So there's multiple levels of, um, of steps that has, have to be done. Um, yeah, and the, the, the main step for ORCID would be to first search for a list of identifiers that match the term, which could be multiple because multiple people could have the same name or similar names. And then the, the curator would need to select one from the drop down box or from the whatever entry mechanism. And Dataverse would need to um, look up the name for each of the results because it's not in the, in the first result that the ORCID search um, answer delivers. Um, I, can, I can go into detail uh, if you want to, um, also one-on-one -on -one if you want afterwards. Uh, so just talking about the advantages and disadvantages. Um, one advantage of this approach would be that metadata would um, represent snapshots of the API data. So if there would be a change, let's say within the ORCID record, this would um, not change in the metadata that's already published. It would stay the same for, for the long term and only metadata updates um, could, could trigger or could, could um, include new information that maybe was changed since the last version. Um, is that understandable, this aspect? Um, yeah, maybe, maybe you have a question about this afterwards. Um, so yeah, the metadata would uh, include um, the values that are uh, retrieved from the API. And as seen in the, in the issues for 772, it would also make a lot of sense to uh, save this provenance information, like which URL or which endpoint of the API was used, which version of the API was used, and so on. Um, I had it in this slide a bit where I um, made a mock-up basically <laughs> of what a configuration could look like for a metadata source. And here I just gave a name, um, put in the version that's currently being used by ORCID, which is the preferred version. And um, of course, the most important thing are the URL from where this um, information is retrieved and the IDs which are used in this so that when you go back in another, in another point of time and want to um, actualize the, the data that you have, the same API that you can use and that you know where it came from originally. And yeah, any REST API could be used uh, in this mechanism. You wouldn't need to specify when, when designing this in software uh, which APIs will be used because of the generalized um, layout of REST APIs. And of course, there's also a disadvantage. Uh, I only see this one, maybe others see other disadvantages, but for me, it's the you only have problem. One minute. That, thanks. The only problem is that you would need to figure out how to make this sustainable, how to make it flexible for the installation managers to, or the admins to, uh, to set up and configure and how to preserve this information in the long term, um, which of course uh, pr produces lots of path dependencies that would need to be resolved at some point. And maybe we can work around that issue a bit. Yeah, thank you for that. And um, let's keep talking, experimenting. Here again, the link to the 4772. And again, that issue is closed. Any efforts uh, should go into 6030 into the generalized effort. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Jonas. Um, so if I think, Sonia, we've got time for a couple questions if people have them, is that right? It is 8.45, but you can take a minute. Okay, um, if anybody has any pressing questions, please go ahead and add them. Um, I see one, uh, somebody's asking with you, do you deal with the life cycle? Do you wanna 
try and answer that? Let me just find the chat, sorry. I, <laughs> this looks a bit different than before. So the problem, do you deal with, I, I don't quite understand the question. <laughs> Yeah, maybe hard. Let, let me let me just make a quick comment. And we we can try and move on to the next talk here and and get this in the the main discussion with with some more details. Um, I I actually in a previous life did a similar thing to this with Orchid, and in in that instance, to, to make an interesting contrast, all we stored in the database was the Orchid ID, and so we tried to pick up live. Right, if somebody changed their email or new things happened on Orchid, we would pick them up. And so I, I bring that up. This is like this is awesome stuff, and I think this is a an interesting direction for us in Dataverse because people are complex objects. Somebody already manages details about people, and in some sense, right now we've got duplication of that effort inside Dataverse. And and a lot of what Jonas was talking about is is really you know how do you map those two things together um, right so we, we how, if we change dataverse I think we could make Jonas's job a lot easier in trying to get this sort of thing in um, so I, I guess with with that um, I, again um, please get your questions together um, in the in the chat or the document and we'll keep moving on here um, and and thanks again Jonas. Um, Philip, do you yeah, want to go you ahead? For listening. Yep. Philip, do you want to jump in and keep us rolling here? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me and see my screen? Yep, all good. Yeah. Thanks. Um, thanks for inviting me to this session. Um, my topic is uh, about submitted metadata issues. So Jim asked me to give a brief presentation about that. Um, yeah. Um, so what I, uh, just to illustrate how important metadata is also for the database community, um, I found when I searched for uh, metadata in uh, Google uh, group uh, discussion threads, I found uh, 360 uh, threads and they, on the um, Dataverse repository on GitHub, I found 269 open issues. So one of them or two of them, uh, Jonas has just been talking about. Uh, here you see how they are distributed um, through time. Um, and also Jim said yesterday, we should make time for this. So here you see the, the top three GitHub metadata issue submitters um, and the top three Google group metadata discussion thread initiators. Uh, so I then tried to um, um, summarize some of the issues based on the question, what are the desirable properties of metadata in Dataverse or of metadata and metadata management in Dataverse? And that is, as a result, I made this list that I'm going to present um, uh, of properties which metadata and metadata management in Dataverse ideally should have whenever possible and appropriate. And I grouped these um, properties under some main topics, topic head headings. The first topic he heading is uh, coverage. Um, so ideally metadata should cover as many subjects or domains as relevant for the Dataverse community. Um, and also um, about function, uh, Dataverse should provide metadata as, uh, for as many functions as relevant for the Dataverse community, including descriptive metadata, technical metadata, administrative data, data, metadata, use metadata, and preservation metadata. Um, and metadata should also be applied at different levels, uh, at the level of Dataverse or collection, at the level of dataset, folder, file, and variable. Uh, then there is this uh, topic about compliance and control. Uh, metadata should of course be um, compliant with standards whenever possible. And the relation to standards, standards should be documented, for instance, in crosswalks. Um, registered metadata should be validated against applied standards before publication of data set. Um, Metadata should also be handled in compliance with privacy regulations, for instance, the GDPR. 
and the um, values of fields um, should be determined by external controlled and standardized vocabularies, which prefer preferably also have uh, internationalization support so that you, for instance, uh, can have keywords in, in multiple languages. Uh, fields should be configurable as mandatory, recommended and optional. Um, metadata sh should be licensed in a machine actionable way and uh, the use of metadata schemas should be informed by best practice guidelines as for instance we saw yesterday uh, the data with north metadata best practice guide uh, the value of metadata fields uh, should be defined in a non uh, it should be possible to define metadata the value of metadata fields in a non editable way uh, for instance through mandatory metadata templates yeah, I'll skip, skip the last one. Uh, some issues uh, regarding flexibility. Uh, metadata uh, should be, we should be able to migrate or, or, or um, move metadata between repository applications. And uh, that database should also support non-standardized metadata if this is um, appropriate. Um, uh, we should uh, provide multiple options for metadata registrations, including uh, filling in, in schemas, which is probably the most common way, but also upload, uploading a metadata file or via an API call. Um, description and watermark values of fields should be configurable through internationalization support tools. Um, yeah, I skipped the last one. Five minutes, Philip. Thank you. Uh, the next topic is integration. Uh, metadata schema should allow seamless integration with external tools and services, for instance, controlled vocabularies, curation tools, uh, lab books, uh, preservation tools, and so on. Um, metadata records should be, um, uh, should, should be able to um, uh, easily upload uh, metadata records in, in batches also, which makes it more efficient. Uh, and as many fields as possible should be pre-populated with values available from other sources, for instance, account information and single sign-on, like for instance, the, the uh, ORCID that um, Jonas has been talking about. Um, and the schemas and other features of metadata uh, should be implemented based on uh, discussions in relevant communities. I think this was my last uh, um, property. And here I've listed some topics to discuss in, in this session. So the first one, how should we organize or coordinate metadata issues in, in Dataverse? Do we need, for instance, working groups dealing with metadata? And if yes, um, where should we embed these working groups? And some options are um, the Global Dataverse Community Consortium. And we should also um, keep an eye on uh, the RDA interest and working groups and other, other international networks. And uh, where do we manage these issues? Um, for instance, on GitHub, uh, someone also mentioned um, the option of uh, registering standards in, in, in fair sharing. Um, and then uh, my sec second question is, uh, how, how do we provide, or how could we provide interoperable metadata for more kinds of data? So that we, um, even more kinds of data would be, uh, that we would be able to uh, integrate even more kinds of data in, 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 in linked data, as linked data. Um, and then the third issue or topic we could discuss is uh, how to handle overlapping coverage between metadata schemas. Uh, often um, um, the different schemas have um, similar fields or identical fields. For instance, the, the, the contributor field is found in, in several schemas, for instance, in, in the Dublin Core schema and also in the code metadata schema. Yeah. That's what, what I had. Thank you. Great. You have time for questions. You have two minutes for questions. And uh, there's one question from Marseille to begin if you can look at your chat. Otherwise, I'm happy to read it. Um, let me see. Are you suggesting to be able to have a license for the metadata exports different from the license of the entire data set? 
or should the data set license make sure that it reflects the metadata license? <laughs> I'm not quite sure. I, I mean, uh, I think that the most important thing is that that um, the license somehow also covers that we also have a license about the metadata. I'm not sure if this is the case today or if, if it's only the, uh, the license. Uh, I mean, the CC0, which is default in, in many repositories, if this only covers the, the data that is archived and not uh, uh, the metadata. I'm not sure, but so, so most importantly, it should be clear that what, what license also, what license applies to the metadata. Marseille, you can jump in if yeah. you want to clarify. Well, yeah, uh, I think, well, the intent of the data set license, we should cover both the metadata and the data. The only thing is that uh, it made me think, your statement made me think that maybe we don't make that uh, very clear or maybe, uh, I know there's been a lot of interest also to have a default for CC BY, for example, that might be more appropriate to cover the metadata. So the CC0 was very much based on, on the, uh, uh, well, it, when it was thought, it was more based on data and facts, right, that are CC0, but when you are adding uh, more to, to a data set, to the, to the, to the actual data, uh, then maybe CC BY applies better. So that's what I'm mean, thinking that maybe we should clarify that, that it is, should include both. Um, uh, yeah. And, and maybe sometimes it could be uh, two separate licenses. I don't know. And, and I don't know what the number is, but there is an issue for that, right, Philip? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I can't remember the numbers. <laughs> So we, we can we can start actually working on that there. Yeah. Are, are there other questions? It's 857 if we um, can move on and then we can take okay. uh, more questions later. All right, um, Richard. Mm -hmm. All right. Hello Go everyone, ahead. good morning to you and good afternoon to the other ones that are a bit further away. Um, my name is Richard Fultz. I work <clears throat> for the International Maize and Wheat uh, Center based in Mexico City and uh, surroundings. And I'm giving this presentation together with my colleague, uh, Jesus Herrera. We have been working on this together. This is just a small contribution to the other works we have been doing uh, together with the Dataverse development team and the community. The idea is to get a, get a good Im impression of uh, why we need this. First of all, we are a, big uh, agricultural network, one of the largest, uh, the largest agricultural research network uh, on the globe. So Sorry, we, Richard, do you have slides or are we just, uh, are we, we weren't sure if you weren't sharing by accident. Um, wait a sec. Can you see it now? No. I you are co-hosting. Uh, yeah, you are co-hosting, so you should be able to share your slides. Yes, and I'm pressing that. That's weird. Jesus, can you try to, to share it? In my case, Hello? We can hear you, and I don't know if Jesus is muted. Okay. Can you, do you want to stop and restart your screen share? Or Jesus has it. Okay, there we go. Okay. All set. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, so the idea is that we, we both have been working on this with a broader team here in CIMIT and to get uh, just an understanding why we need this. Uh, we also need this because we are a very large uh, group of centers and we need to improve the quality on how we can use controlled vocabularies. So if we go to the next, then we also see the network. Let's see. 
We have it or not? Sharing has stopped for some reason. Now it's back? Yes. Okay, good. So these are the centers where we work worldwide, which is a quite a huge network. These are only the headquarters that we're mentioning here. So we also in CIMIT have a lot of uh, worldwide offices where we need to guarantee that we get a different quality in how we, we index and uh, get the information documented that we require in the different locations and get somehow of a standard. So the motivation here has been that we wanted an integrated uh, vocabularies. And I think we're trying to be uh, a bit more flexible here that we say you can have different types of controlled vocabularies added depending on the usage uh, that you, you require and depending on what exactly is needed. Uh, for us, an important point is definitely the accuracy and that we scale up the level. We have been working in, in Dataverse in the past in, in different ways as well. And uh, for example, with the handle minting, um, we have been looking into requirements made by our curators and, and data coordinators. Uh, and we then presented this, uh, discussed this with the IQSS. And then we, we do have not have your, okay, the slides just keep going on and off, Richard, so I apologize. It looks like it's back on now. Okay, now it's back. Hello? It's back, but not in presentation mode. Okay, that is really weird. Now? Yes. Okay, so, uh, we went on with the team to continue implementing this. Then we looked into having an agnostically managed uh, system that also allows us to upload lists with CSV files, which really makes it easier for people who, who are different. We have very people working at very remote locations that they could also have their own way of, of using controlled vocabularies to increase uh, the quality they're working with. So this is something we have already looked in. We're using the AgroVoc, which is uh, uh, made and, and managed, maintained by FAO. So that's a, a very big controlled vocabulary and we are extracting uh, the bits and pieces that we require. Also, depending on the, on the languages we are, we are looking into. So the idea here is that you have uh, a dropdown control where you can select which of the control vocabularies you want to utilize. And then we have also sort of the functionality that it's a, it, it, it allows you to type the first letters and then you get the suggestions that you can integrate. I think that is something very important also specifically for countries that are building documentations in English but are not all native speakers. I think this is also something that from a quality uh, perspective is really uh, something we should consider if we are thinking of having data uh, implemented and utilized across the globe. Uh, so we already produced uh, some prototypes. Uh, as I said, uh, this development is led by Jesus Herrera, who's also online. Um, after the QA process from the Dataverse team, I hope that this will be uh, included in a, in a future release. And I, I hope that this will also contribute to reduce, as I said earlier, the different uh, arbitraries as well as the misspelling. And, and we are looking into a, a much easier way of, of maintaining this in future. So if you have any questions, I mean, we will also answer the questions that have been raised, but we would, you can also contact us directly if there are any, any things you would like to discuss with us in this regard. We actually do have some time. So we have about uh, three minutes for questions. Mm -hmm. You do have a question in the chat, Richard, if you, um, I'm happy to read it if you cannot see it. Okay. How did you manage the tree structure of um, AgroVoc? Did you limit yourself to a particular level? Yes, we limited ourselves to a particular level, that's correct. Because we wanted to 
just utilize, utilize it for the, for the purpose of uh, uh, specific lists that we need. And we're talking about data sets in this case. So we're not talking about a, something that is uh, extremely, context, extremely complex, at least in our context. So I think that's uh, what we did. We have a flat, flat list uh, that is working uh, pretty well. So we don't have hierarchical lists for the time being. I think that's something we could discuss, but for the purpose of what we needed and where we got support also from the big data initiative of the CGIR was to develop that we can add our, our flat hierarchical lists uh, to that. And, the, and that is an extract from uh, Agrobok uh, terminology. Marseille has a question. Okay. It might be. Hi, it might be easier to just say. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't know, I understood the mechanism for choosing the control vocabulary from the form, from when you're editing the metadata values. When, uh, what, what is the, what a, what a tool, what, a, what technology do you use for that? Hello. How does it connect? Or are you proposing? Hello. Well, we, have, we, can, we can connect up to level of CSV files to the, to the list, so we can just. Contribute? Sorry. Hello, may I contribute? Yes, please. Hello, everybody. This is Jesus speaking. Uh, basically, in this very first approach, um, we developed uh, a very simple um, functionality uh, with which you can just upload CSV files containing the controlled vocabularies you are interested in, you can upload as many controlled vocabularies as you want, and then <clears throat> you link some specific metadata elements to this uh, lookup functionality, so that when you want to uh, input a, a, a value in one of those metadata elements that are linked to uh, this uh, uh, functionality, then you will see a drop down list with all the uh, um, vocabularies available. Then you will pick the vocabulary you are interested in. And then when you will type the first letters of uh, the term you are interested in, it will. Uh, like a lookup, like an uh, yeah, right, right, right. So, but, but the, the CSV, the, these uh, vocabularies are stored in the database. So what are they coming from or part from a service? Yeah, basically every user, every user needs to first build those CSV files. They are not standard CSV files out there, uh, depending on their uh, own interests. I mean, uh, if uh, we see it are interested in uh, Agrobok, but only the English version, then we need to build a CSV with only the uh, English uh, terms of Agrobok. And uh, of course, this will not include the relations among terms because it's it's only a plain uh, control vocabulary in this version. Okay, that's great. It just I wonder because Slava also has a tool for like a lookup of control vocabularies. So I wonder how the technology, I mean, how the way it was implemented, how similar or non similar, and if you could uh, sort of uh, well consolidate those two forms of doing the same, what it seems to me is the same thing. I don't know if Slava wants to add anything about that. Or, or we can do that in that later. Theme. Yes, let's do that later because we're actually right on schedule now. We've caught up to the schedule so we can move on to um, actually the group discussion, okay. which is on the community. Um, Jim, did you want to say something else before we move to the group discussion? Yeah, I, I want to throw one more slide up just to um, kind of segue in there. And again, Mercedes' comment is almost a, a good segue as well, right? As, as is uh, what uh, Philip was saying, that, that there really is a, right, a, a metadata, meta challenge here that if you look at all the features that we're interested in, I think you've already heard um, you know, from Jonas that part of the issues he was facing were trying to fit that into the current structure in Dataverse. Um, I think you could look at, the, at what uh, Richard and, and Jesus have done in the same way that, um, you know, there might be better ways to do it, but it would require changes to the, more changes to the internals of Dataverse to make it happen. And I, I just wanted to point out that, you know, all the other sessions that we're talking about, right, my definition of, of metadata is that, um, you know, it's everything that makes Dataverse something more than a file system, right? And, and you know, uh, jokingly, but if we're going to be 
exporting and, and importing, you know, questions are raised of what happens if you import from somebody who's using a vocabulary that's not in your database yet. Um, data tags, we saw a recommender system that wouldn't it be nice if that recommender could pick up metadata and help make you help you decide on the sensitivity level based on the metadata that's available. We've got a capsule session where we've got automated tools that are trying to identify which files and the relationships between files in order to actually work on them. Um, you know, if those get edited manually, they break the tool. Um, there might not be a separate vocabulary because the vocabulary is really defined by the tool itself. Um, so in some sense, we've got a lot of these things where you know, if, if we continue to try and handle them as one issue at a time, they're really hard to do and they really start to make things more and more complex and, and are going to slow us down. So part of where I wanted to kind of launch us into the discussion is, you know, what are the things we need to do to avoid that gridlock and, and minimize complexity with all these things coming in? It's still got to be a usable system, right? And if it's all sort of one off, that's going to be very, very hard to get anybody to be able to use it or manage it. Um, how can we redesign? I think there are ideas, you know, I have some, I've heard some from other people and I, I won't go into them here, but in some sense, they're not all completely coherent yet. And just like a standards organization, I think we've got to get to a consensus before anybody's really going to be able to make rapid progress. So, um, you know, behind that is then the questions of, of what do we need to make that process happen? Um, so with that, I'll, I'll, drop this uh, screen share here and let us go back to um, comments and questions. Okay, um, Katie, um, are you going to share the screen for the questions or would you like me to do so? Um, yeah, I can do it. Give me one second. Thank you. Maybe in, in addition to what uh, Jim just said, which I'm, I'm absolutely supportive of, I think we have uh, uh, Two, two realities if we look at our day-to-day -day work. We, have, we work for an organization, for an employer, and we have to deliver certain results and quality. And on the other hand, we have this big visionary view of things, of how we think that Dataverse could grow and, and become a, a more powerful tool. So I think definitely uh, uh, combining different efforts in this regard, coming to, understanding, uh, to an understanding of what is really required to service very small institutions up to very large ones, and what what type of flexibility can we give within this this uh, specific topic? So I think uh, we would be more than happy to be part of such a discussion. But I think I, I fully agree we have to look at it from different angles so that we can have something that is really serving the community as a whole. Yeah, that that's great. And I'll I'll just point to the um, from the GDCC sessions that the RDA grant we got really was was an opportunity where we actually got um, uh, Texas and QDR and UNC and uh, Odom and Harvard to all join in and say we're going to you know if, if we get this money we'll all adopt it together but we basically were able to go out and get some external funding to do something a little bit more advanced and sort of solve a one-off issue and so I, I, I don't you know I think we hopefully can be looking for those kinds of opportunities here in metadata as well if we can package up you know some coherent part of it. Perfect. Are there other questions people are seeing? And Katie has uh, put up the uh, discussion questions, so feel free to tackle those whenever you'd like. It, I think, it, you know, again, if you've got any questions that are directly on any of the talks, please pull them up. Um, if you want to um, get the microphone, because I know some of these are hard to, to type out if you just have a comment. So go ahead, raise hands, and we'll get you that way. Yeah, I just wanted to add that I, I put the link to my slides in the session document. OK, great, thanks. And we, we, we will be sharing all of them afterwards. I don't know that we have all of them yet, but uh, they'll, they'll go out. And, and of course, this is being recorded as well. Hi, Jim. This is Jerry Lake. I don't know if this is part of this metadata discussion or maybe a future one. Uh, is about um, the metadata that we send to data site or metadata that the, that the program actually sends to other external um, like 
the metadata that schema.org has and things like that. I don't know. It's, it's sort of the, it's what Dataverse has inside that it actually shares on the outside. Um, because I know there's been some discussion about how the field and some of the attributes um, data site either doesn't like or schema.org, um, Julian might be able to do in more detail, but that's another side of this. Yeah, definitely. That That's um, an interesting one that the, the one example I know of, uh, at least lately, is that uh, um, when we put things like a contact, I think one of those schema wants it to be a human and we allow organizations because it's just a string. And so if you, if you if it isn't a person record when it goes out there, they don't like it. Right? And that, that's one of the challenges, I think, for some of these uh, uh, schema and ontologies is that they Right, they, they can often be slightly stricter than we would like about what the values can be. Um, and so there, there's always these kinds of mismatches or, or bridging that has to be done. Thanks for the, the comment. There was a question from Janet um, that is on the chat. What is the interest in metadata licensing? Are you referring to DOC DSCR or NDDI? Philip, do you know? Um, no, actually not. But I, I think the, the, the issue is that you should uh, license your metadata so that others know how they can reuse them. For instance, aggregators or wh whoever. I think right now, at least in our repository, there is it's not kind of built in what, how we license all the metadata that is available in the repository. So we have to put this information on on an, on, a, on our on a web page information web page where we say that all, all the metadata included in our repository is licensed on the CC zero. Uh, I, I'll have to check. I, I put a comment in the in the OAI ORE export. Um, part of what the ORE standard does is make sure that you have a separation between the metadata and the things you're talking about, and you have a place to put a license in. And I, I hope I did that. But if I didn't, and, and again, I think it's always CC zero at this point because that's the right the the metadata is always open, even if the files and things are restricted at this point. But um, right, you can see them without going through any accepting any any terms or anything. Um, but if I haven't done that, that would be one place we could we could make sure that goes in. Yes, I, I think Janet, um, this is Sherry again. Um, it, it just refers to an element that's in the DDI because um, um, Dataverse the citation block is describing the data sets, but also in DDI there's a section about describing the metadata, and I think maybe that's where a license field could be put in. And I don't think Dataverse actually takes advantage of metadata from metadata. <laughs> or the... Marseille has a question as well. Uh, well, more than a, do you hear me? More than a question, a, a comment for the chair. That I wonder if we could take just three minutes or so and Slava could show live the, the, the tool, the, uh, the other tool, so we can start consolidating all the tools that are from the community that are doing the same. Sure, absolutely. If there is no time, we could yeah. do it another, but I just thought that, that maybe, uh, would, uh, since everybody's here interested in this, then it would be a good chance. Yeah, if, if Slava's uh, there and ready. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready. So, uh, <laughs> always, always ready. <laughs> always ready, yes. Uh, so basically, uh, we're developing uh, external control vocabularies uh, support in Shock project, and we already managed to connect uh, this tool to a few fields. And I will just share my screen, and I will show you very quickly how it works. So basically, uh, we have uh, in our project we have assessed the control vocabulary service, and you see. It's aggregation of all control vocabularies for DDIs, and there are a lot of control vocabularies. So what they, we did, we actually created, um, oh, one second. Yeah, so we cre created kind of middleware. So it's a service deployed uh, next to Dataverse, let's say. And it's it does just look up to uh, control vocabularies, and it just delivers basically a JSON with uh, uh, different suggestions. 
So in a tool in, in uh, Dataverse, uh, we are able just to go to a keyword field and I can type for something and I will get list of suggested terms and it will be filled here. So you see a vocabulary and vocabulary URL and we can add more uh, suggestions. So uh, it's a quite universal solution because uh, using this middleware, we can connect to different ontologies. And uh, now, because uh, our task actually is to support says the metadata schema, it means for every field, it probably can be different uh, ontology. So now we're trying to connect up into uh, middleware and after some time it will be available for community as well. So this is my short talk. And if you have questions, we, we have repository and uh, we are ready to collaborate with other people. Philip has a, a question. Yeah, I think it would be, I'd be interested to hear some thoughts uh, from the attendees on, on uh, how we better could coordinate metadata issues. On one of my slides, I had the idea of uh, uh, establishing working groups within the Global Data uh, Community Consortium or any other thoughts about that? Yeah, one, one thing I can add in is uh, I've waved the flag for um, a draft metadata document that, that's um, that, that I've started trying to do and, and I'm trying to been bouncing off of uh, uh, Gustavo and others. And, and the, I think, right, that's something that really needs community input. And, and the reason it's sort of draft and not out right now is mostly because um, I think it's, we want to start thinking about these design issues and I don't want anyone to start thinking that that's the design yet, right? It, it really is draft, but it needs a bigger group to be on the draft side and the development stage of it. So I, I'd be very interested in thinking about a metadata group that would really have the time to help push that kind of discussion forward. And I, I think the stuff that you showed in your talk of just kind of, you know, you know, organizing the, the issues that are involved in the categories of changes we're trying to do and the use cases we're covering, you know, those would be a, a great start that then we can start thinking about what is it that we need to do in the design level. Are there other, other thoughts? This is uh, John, uh, John Hack. Hi. Um, yeah, I think um, this is a, a, a great discussion. I'm really glad to hear that, that uh, so many people are interested in, in, in thinking about metadata on a kind of a, a long range uh, goal. Um, and I think just, uh, just a couple comments I want to throw in. I think, I think that, um, you know, it's a, the, the, the importance of kind of trying to follow standards and use standards that are out there. Um, I would just kind of put a, put a plug in for that. I think that's important. It's, uh, but I also think it's, it's maybe going to make it easy, like it, uh, in some ways, following the standards is a little bit, means a little bit more, uh, you know, work on the front end, but then in theory, it makes things easier down the road if you can use things like schema validation and, and whether that's XML schemas or whether it's like Shex and Shackle and things like that, but there, you, you kind of, you, you gain the ability to use some of those other tools um, and to manage complex relationships between different different metadata standards. Um, and so that's why I found it really interesting that the DDI, um, you know, cross domain integration um, had that focus on on a model. Um, and, and, you know, I, I don't know whether, well, anyway, I, 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 I hesitate to suggest things that might be mean a lot more work, but I, I almost wonder whether that is a, a model a model to take uh, for Dataverse that, that maybe there's a need to develop a kind of a, a middle model between the data, database implementation and some of these standards. And that might just make it easier to, you know, add new vocabularies um, or I mean, uh, well, vocabularies or standards um, and, and just do that coordinating work um, <clears throat> And um, yeah, I don't know, that, that, that's a, a possible oh, idea. That's great. It, would, it would take obviously, you know, you, you need to have a, 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 you know, a, a, enough support and people to kind of, you know, take on a big piece of work like that. Right, I, I'd like to make a couple quick comments. One is just, um, 
the way that uh, when we're talking about ORCID as an external thing, the, the way that we actually built that in the prior system I worked on is, is as some JavaScript that it handled the input and output. So it would do the type ahead um, and let you select. And once you selected one, it changed the display. So it was the person's name with a link to their ORCID page and their, their email in parentheses. But in some sense, that JavaScript was completely independent of our particular product. It was, it was something we actually talked about before we ran out of money and time to hand back to ORCID and say, you know, just stick this on the front of your API and let people use this JavaScript. And then none of our tools have to develop that. And, you know, it'd be interesting to look at that kind of model and see if we can get out of the business of having to do a lot of the stuff with the schema because we can we can either share that burden with other tools or get them from the, the source of the services. We have one question for Tomas and then it is uh, 926. So we'll be wrapping up. It was not really a question. Uh, but Comment. Also the people yeah do you hear me um it was not really a question it was just to say that uh, metadata working group would interest me really much uh, but i put it in the comments anyway great and the other thing i was wanting to say which i think if we i'll look for other questions but i can use it as a summary comment as well so i, I don't see any more is there any more that we see Okay, so, so I'll, I'll go ahead and, and wrap up. And the, the last thing I wanted to say is, is you know, I, I was involved in um, a couple of the provenance standards, starting with the open provenance model. And, and the, the thing that really struck me in those kind of efforts was that, you know, we, there was a period where we spent years where everybody was saying provenance is important and I've got an idea and I've got my own model and, and everybody saying they wanted, you know, more and a more coherent model and what really what it really took was all of that sort of enthusiasm and activity to boil down to three people spending about 14, 15 hours in one room where every change that they wanted to discuss was bounced off the existing use cases so that everybody understood, you know, when, when that tweak is going to break everything that had come before. And that's really how we got to that. And I, I think that's where I see the, the need for these kinds of coordinating documents and groups here is the same thing. We've got lots of interest and activity and a lot of issues and, and it's really just hard to get, it, it's hard to work in that kind of environment and through those kinds of constraints to actually get where we need to go. So I, I think something intensive and, and really focused on moving this forward is, is something that, that, you know, I, I hope we can come out of this uh, meeting with, with some uh, activity to go there. So with that, um, uh, in our last couple of minutes, uh, again, I'd just like to thank you all for showing up um, both here in the meeting and showing up in terms of issues and the comments that we've got here and the activity around metadata. So um, I appreciate the, the time you've all spent here and, and the energy you're putting in and hopefully we can uh, keep this all moving forward. Um, with that, I think we've got, uh, I forget what the next session is, is that the uh, external tools next or is it the uh, external, external tools yep and then on to remote stores so i think you have about 15 minutes in between to refill coffee and then come join us in the next session so thank you all very much <laughs>